Right, okay, I think we've got plenty of people online at the minute, so I'll kick off. Hello everyone again, um, and welcome to the MDC Connects webinar series. Um, I'm Sarah Brockbank, I'm the lead scientist at Medicine's Discovery Catapult, and I'm hosting the session today with my colleague Dan Bond. Um, we're now in the third um, in this series of weekly webinars, which runs on a Wednesday, at, that runs every Wednesday um, at two o'clock. So today, as I said, it's the third in the series um, of nine informative drug discovery sessions. And each of these sessions is delivered by experts at Medicines Discovery Catapult and our CRO network partners. Um, and each of the sessions is focused on an aspect of preclinical drug discovery. Um, we started with selection of the right target, and last week we were talking about identifying the hit. Um, we go through today's, which is structural approaches through optimizing the compound, the KPD, disease models, and finish with strategies for safety and developing biomarkers. So in this third session, as I say, we're thinking about structural approaches for drug discovery. And I'd like to welcome three speakers. Firstly, Derek Ogg, who's Chief Scientific, Chief Scientific Officer at Peak Proteins, who's going to provide an overview of protein expression and purification, X-ray crystal structures and how to get them. Then Rebecca Thompson, who's Electro, Electron Microscopy Manager and Senior Cryo-EM Senior cryo -EM Scientist at Asprey Biostructure Laboratories at the University of Leeds. Which is going to focus on cryo EM and how this can be applied to your drug discovery project. And finally, Martin Slater, Director of Consulting Services at Cresset. And Martin will talk about a computational chemistry approach to making molecules that matter. So we will take questions at the end of each of the presentations. And if you wish to ask a question, type those into the QA box at the bottom of the screens, um, not into the chat box and the speakers will address them at the end of each of their talks. So over to you, Derek. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen. I hope you can all see that. Yep. Great. Okay, so my name is Derek Ogg, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, two topics. One is protein production, and the other one is structure determination of actual crystallography. Now, these are both two very large topics on their own and could do with a seminar series to do them justice. So in this next 15 minutes, I'm only really going to be able to give you a very brief introduction and a very top level view of both of these. So let's uh, kick right in. So uh, as you all probably know, proteins are the targets of the vast majority of marketed uh, drugs today. Um, if you're involved in a, a target-based drug development project, you'll require a pretty good supply of high quality purified proteins for a number of steps along the process, such as assay development, high throughput screening, uh, biophysical analysis, and also a potentially structured determination. And of course, proteins themselves are, are important uh, biological therapeutics in their own right. Uh, so being able to produce high quality uh, proteins is, uh, is uh, certainly an important thing. Historically, uh, proteins are produced from natural sources, such as animal organs, blood and plants, for instance. Uh, but that's only really uh, suitable for a small uh, number of, uh, of proteins, those that are highly expressed. Uh, lots of proteins that are of interest today are produced in very small quantities within cells and so generally proteins are produced recombinantly these days. Um, this typically involves generating a, a synthetic and code and optimized gene of the target of interest, including that into an expression vector or plasmid and transfecting that into uh, cultured cells for overexpression. Of the common expression cell systems today, E. coli is probably the cheapest, the easiest, and the fastest, and is suitable for, for many proteins. However, if you're interested in a protein that's particularly large or is involved in a complex 
or is a eukaryotic protein that requires post-translational modifications, then you probably uh, need a eukaryotic expression cell system that has the machinery to, to handle those proteins. And uh, examples of that are baculovirus insect cells uh, or mammalian cells, uh, such as the HEC293 uh, system. And depending on how much you need, you can grow volumes from a few tens of litres up to thousands of litres. So how expensive that will be very much depends on the system. And for mammalian cell systems, that could be pretty pricey indeed. Before you get into sort of expressing your protein of interest, perhaps the most crucial step in the whole process is designing your protein construct. Um, this is a kind of optimization process where you uh, uh, try to optimize uh, uh, the construct of the protein uh, involving a, a careful choice of a number of different aspects. One is, and perhaps the most important really, is what form of the protein is required. Uh, do you need the full length protein? Is it just the catalytic or functional domain? Uh, is it a, a, a protein in complex with another protein? And are post-translational modifications uh, required for the function? The answers to those questions inform on what expression system or expression vectors you want to use, uh, whether it is going to go into E. coli or insect or mammalian or yeast. Another important aspect is, do you want to add uh, affinity tags or fusion tags to your protein. And the reason you might want to do this is to enable uh, easy purification, for instance, adding a, a 6-his tag or a, a GST or a streptibidin tag at the end or C-terminals. You can also use uh, protein fusions to try and increase the solubility of your protein, such as uh, Maltese binding protein or the sumo domain, and to enable uh, particular assays, such as SBR assay, you might want to add an AVI tag and bitinolate that. For structural studies later on, you might also want to remove structural heterogeneity, such as removing disordered domains or disordered loops and truncating NNC termini. Once you've uh, decided on the construct and you've expressed it in uh, your cell system of choice, you then want to purify the protein. And this is generally carried out by fairly standard liquid chromatography methods, uh, which uh, rely on the different physical properties of your proteins. Uh, most common of these is affinity chromatography, where you separate based on the affinity either of the protein itself or the fused tag, such as uh, the 6-histidine tag you purify on a nickel column. Uh, and often these tags can be subsequently removed by protease treatment if you've included a, a protease cleavage site. Uh, the other methods are quite commonly used as ion exchange, where you separate the proteins based on protein charge, or size exclusion chromatography, which you separate based on the molecular size. And just a, a point at the bottom, really, about uh, membrane proteins. These can be particularly difficult to purify due to their hydrophobicity and th their uh, lack of stability when they're removed from the protein uh, membrane environment. And quite often, this results in you needing to take make careful use of lipids and detergents to solubilize the membrane protein and often you require uh, stabilizing mutations to uh, keep the protein uh, functional when it's out of the uh, out of the membrane and in solution. Once you've got your protein purified then it's important to know uh, uh, the quality of the protein and generally there's a standard uh, QA package that you get from suppliers um, and these include things like SDS gels, which gives you an indication of the purity and the appropriate approximate molecular size of the denatured protein, the absorbance at 280 nanometers, which gives you an, a good estimate of the protein concentration, uh, analytical size exclusion chromatography, which gives you the molecular size of your protein or the complex in solution, and very usefully uh, uh, mass spectrometry analysis, you can use uh, for intact mass spec, which can give you an accurate uh, molecular mass with post-translation modifications, and also peptide mass fingerprinting, which can confirm the, the ID of the protein. And perhaps most important is a functional assay. Is your protein functional when once it's purified? Does it have a, its expected catalytic activity? 
Uh, once you have a protein that's purified, one of the things you might want to do is know it's, what, it's, what its structure is. Uh, reasons for doing that is that protein structures themselves can inform on the function of the protein. Uh, if you're involved in a drug development project, you can use high resolution structures of protein ligand complexes to enable structure based uh, ligand design. These can explain uh, structure activity relationships and help the chemists uh, design compounds. And if you're uh, using uh, a fragment based ligand design approach, then structures are essential for uh, progressing the project. So one of the methods for uh, getting protein uh, structures uh, is actually crystallography. Another common one is cryo-M, which uh, Rebecca will uh, talk about af after my talk. Uh, X-ray crystallography is an experimental method that relies on uh, the fact that X-rays can be diffracted by periodic assemblies of atoms and molecules within crystals. And X-rays just have the appropriate wavelength to be scattered by electron clouds of atoms of, uh, of comparable size. And by recording the uh, resulting diffraction patterns of uh, the electron density within the crystal can be reconstructed uh, mathematically. The X-rays that are typically used these days uh, are generated using uh, synchrotron light sources. These are basically particle accelerators, uh, such as the one at Diamond light source. And, and these uh, generate incredibly intense X-rays that are uh, required for getting high resolution diffraction images from very, very small crystals. So the first thing you need is, of course, is to get your protein to crystallize. And unfortunately, there's no way of predicting the conditions that will crystallize a protein just from knowing its amino acid sequence. As a result, you have to use a rather empirical process where you uh, screen a, a large number of uh, uh, cocktails of chemicals uh, that include precipitants, buffers, and salts, together with the, the protein of interest to try and find uh, uh, those conditions that will actually produce crystals that will also diffract. And this is typically carried out these days robotically in 96 well, 96 well plates and can use very small volumes up to about uh, 100 nanoliters in each well. And common methods include vapor diffusion, microbatch and microdialysis. Uh, and that basically involves just mixing uh, small quantities of protein with each of the cocktails in a sealed container. And then through vapor diffusion, uh, water moves from the, the drop with the protein into the reservoir and slowly increases the concentration of the protein in the drop uh, to uh, a, a point where it becomes super saturated and then hopefully comes out of solution as a crystal uh, rather than as just as a precipitant. If all goes well, these are some pictures of the beautiful crystals that you can end up with. Of course, an uh, important point is that even though a crystal might look beautiful, it doesn't necessarily diffract well. Um, so it's not, uh, obtaining crystals is, is not uh, uh, all you require. You actually require crystals that are internally very, very ordered, uh, so they will diffract a high resolution. The diffraction experiment itself is very simple. You just mount the crystal, uh, on a goniometer and uh, expose it to an X-ray beam uh, and then collect the resulting diffraction image, such as the one on the right-hand side. The uh, experiment gives you two pieces of information. You get the position and the intensity of the spots or reflections. However, this information alone is not sufficient to then reconstruct the electron density within a crystal. You also require the phase angle or the relative phase angle of each of uh, reflection. And this information is not captured in uh, diffraction images. And this is the so-called phase problem in crystallography. So to obtain this phase information, what can you do? Well, the easiest approach is to use molecular replacement, where you just take uh, the structure of a protein that's already been solved, that's homologous to the one of interest, and uh, calculate the phases from that. Uh, as, a, as the first step, like, but you can bootstrap yourself uh, further into getting the phases of your target protein. This works well for proteins who has a, a sequence ID of up to about 30%. Uh, for 
uh, proteins that don't have any homologous proteins in the PDB, then you have to do some somewhat more complicated experimental methods. Perhaps the most common one is uh, uh, multiple anomalous dispersion, where you replace the methionine residues in your protein of interest with selenomethionine, which can uh, be carried out by just expressing your protein uh, in media that lacks methionine but contains selenomethionine. And then you can tune the wavelength of the X-rays you use to an absorption edge of, of selenium. This results in uh, difference in intensities uh, of the uh, uh, measured uh, diffraction image, and those differences in intensity can be used to then calculate the phases uh, of the uh, and positions of the selenium methionine atoms within the crystal, and then bootstrap yourself up into, into phasing the whole protein. So once you have the phases, you can then use those uh, to calculate an electron density map in three dimensions. Uh, this is typically done on a gr uh, computer graphics. Uh, you can then build your atomic model into the electron density. Uh, once you have your initial model, uh, you then refine that model against the uh, experimental data to try and improve the model. Uh, which in turn will give you a better estimate of, of the phases. And then you cycle around uh, until you get convergence. And you can monitor the uh, progress of this by a number of statistical measures that are quite commonly used, which is the R factor and the, the R3. Once you have the protein uh, structure, it's important to know uh, how good is it? What's its quality? Is it useful? Uh, is it reliable? And this is not only important for uh, crystallographers, but for consumers of protein structures themselves. So there's various uh, sort of uh, estimates of quality or, or uh, uh, pieces of information that you can use to, uh, to assess the quality of structures. And this involves looking at the quality of the experimental data itself, the resolution, how complete it is, uh, and also the, the redundancy. And also looking at the quality of the model. Does the stereochemistry of the model, its bond lengths and angles, agree with expected values? A particularly useful method is to look at uh, the Ramachandran map, which is the phi psi angles of the protein backbone. Those should all rely in expected uh, uh, regions. If you have a Ramachandran map with spots all over the, the plot, then you have to doubt the quality of the, of the model. Uh, all these statistics are generally very easy to find and are uh, available on the, the protein database itself when you download a structure. So essentially that's, that's it for me. Okay, Derek, let us just take the questions out of the Q&A box. Okay, um, let's see what the questions are. Uh, one question is why a crystal might not diffract at all. Uh, well, as I said, this is basically to do with the internal order within the crystal. Uh, for a crystal to diffract to high resolution, all the atoms or, or the molecules need to be arranged in a very regular uh, three-dimensional array. And if there's a disorder uh, in that some uh, uh, loops or domains are flexible and uh, are not in the same positions, uh, uniformly throughout the crystal, then the crystal might will not diffract. Um, another question is: um, Can you purify suitable protein amount of protein from HEC two nine three cells and use for crystallography? Uh, yes, you can absolutely. Uh, and what is the main difference between production in HEC and insect cells? Uh, the process itself is, is, is slightly different in that with viruses, you have to introduce the gene of interest into a, a, vi into a virus vector first and then inf infect insect cells. Whereas with hex cells, you just introduce the gene straight into, uh, uh, into the, uh, the hex cells themselves. Uh, why one protein will work better in one system or in another is, is sometimes a bit of a black art and both some really you generally have to try both systems to see which one works best. Uh, we've got time for any more questions. 
Uh, there's one question, are there families of proteins which are more difficult to crystallize? Uh, yes, that's, uh, so, for instance, membrane proteins are notoriously tricky to crystallize. Uh, and generally any protein which is, uh, or protein family, which uh, relies on flexibility uh, for function, those can be generally quite difficult to crystallize. You often need a fairly rigid uh, uh, structure for the protein to crystallize in a uniform way to get the high diffraction, high resolution diffraction that you need. Uh, if two proteins have a similar sequence, will they have the same 3D structure? Uh, yes, the answer is yes, they will have a very similar structure. You can, and that's the basis of the molecular replacement method for solving structures is that as long as a, a protein has a structure of around at least 30%, then the overall structures are going to be very similar. And how do you quantify similarity? The similarity uh, can be either at a sequence level, in which you just compare uh, percentage identity of the sequence. And once you have the structures, that's uh, quantified by uh, RMS deviations of, uh, say, C alpha atoms. Okay, thanks, Derek. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll hand over to Rebecca then. Great, thank you very much, um, Derek. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying um, thank you very much um, to the Medicines Discovery Catapult, um, Sarah and Dan, for organising this fantastic webinar series. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be able to um, yeah, uh, to tune into these uh, and, and hear about different aspects of medicines discovery. So thank you very much for organising. Um, and also a massive thank you to Derek for a fantastic talk and a brilliant lead in to what I'm hoping to talk about um, today. So um, as Sarah said, um, uh, my name's Rebecca. Uh, I work at the University of Leeds managing um, our electron microscopy facility. Um, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about what CryoEM um, can do in medicines discovery. Um, so, um, in terms of um, so in terms of cryoEM uh, or cryoelectron microscopy, what essentially we're talking about um, is being able to use uh, incredibly powerful cryoelectron microscopes um, to collect a series of rather grey and fuzzy images, um, but then work some computational magic on these um, and turn uh, turn the images um, into um, into beautiful um, three dimensional structures. So, uh, so this um, is a structure of a, a virus particle here um, at, at less than three angstroms uh, in terms of its resolution. So cryo-electron microscopy has come a huge way um, in the last five to seven years. Um, if we compare, um, it, on this slide here, I've just shown um, the first cryo structure that I ever solved on the left um, back in 2011. And you can see this macro Molecular complex. We've only solved um, the structure to about 20 angstroms resolution, so we can see the overall architecture, but we absolutely can't see um, a secondary structure, and we certainly can't see um, the individual building blocks of this macromolecular complex, the amino acids. Um, with recent advances in software and hardware, um, cryo-electron microscopy has really been transformed. Like I say, in the last sort of five to seven years. Um, and we're now able um, to routinely solve um, structures for a whole range of different macromolecular complexes um, to better than, um, well, to, um, uh, to better resolutions. Uh, and for a very large number of specimens, we're able to routinely obtain uh, resolutions better than three angstroms. Um, and for all of these advances, back in 2017 now, um, these three gentlemen were awarded um, the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry. It's kind of, kind of as a representation, I guess, of just how far the field has come. Um, but today I want to focus specifically in on what cryo-electron microscopy can do in medicines discovery. Um, at the University of Leeds, we work with a large range of, um, uh, of different groups, uh, many of whom are from, are from industry. Uh, and we tend to find that when people are interested um, in medicines discovery, their projects tend to fit into one of these three categories. Um, so firstly, of course, we just have structured determination of potential targets and a fantastic introduction from Derek there about, uh, about the value which just knowing the structure of your target um, can, bring, uh, can bring to your projects. And once you have your target uh, and a potential compound, um, we can use cryo-electron microscopy to directly be able to examine where a particular small molecule might be found. 
Um, and the real joy of cryo electron microscopy is that we can deal with a bit of heterogeneity in our data set. So if you don't have 100% occupancy, we may still be able to uh, work out the location of, of that small molecule binding. Uh, and finally, we've had a number of projects come through um, in the area of antibody or non-antibody binding proteins, such as aphemers, binding their targets. Uh, and this, is, uh, uh, this uh, category of projects um, is, is an area which we find um, typically highly tractable um, because in the grand, it, compared to a small molecule, an antibody uh, it typically has, has quite a lot of mass, so it's quite easy for us to spot in the EM density maps. Um, so these are the broad areas um, that, that, that I want to talk about today. Um, however, for all of these different applications, what we're basically doing um, is solving a structure of our, of our macromolecular um, complex. And so the pipeline that we go through to solve that structure is actually quite similar um, for all of these applications. So I just want to run through um, that practical pipeline with you today uh, to give you a bit of an idea about time scales and, and the practicalities of the process. Um, so first of all, is my project suitable? So um, the first thing that, that we do when, um, when a new um, client or group comes into work with us is essentially discuss um, the outcomes of the projects. Um, essentially, what is the question and what resolution do you need to answer your question? So for example, I've included an image on the right here, which is a membrane, and we can see these little dark dots, um, which are actually magnetic nanoparticles. This group simply wanted to know whether these black dots were on the inside or the outside of the membrane. So it's very easy for us to, start to answer that with uh, a low resolution single image. Um, however, if you want to, um, in the example below, um, look at the binding site of a small molecule, um, you're going to need a much higher resolution, typically um, better than three angstroms resolution in order to be able to, um, uh, to, to um, determine that with a high level of confidence. So once you've decided that cryo-EM um, really can answer your question, um, the next thing is, um, well, how big is your target? So um, the, the lower, typically we tend to work with proteins and macromolecular complexes, which are about 100 kilodaltons or larger. The smallest complex that's being solved is about 50 kilodaltons, um, but going lower than 100 kilodalton um, as, it, as a unit, um, you, you tend to start um, running into um, uh, fairly significant challenges. But if it's over 100 kilodaltons, then that's, that's becoming fairly routine for us now. And in terms of an upper size limit, this is really where cryo-electron microscopy comes into its own, because we can deal with very large complexes um, uh, up into the megadalton range. Um, so for example, if you have a large macromolecular complex uh, with many different subunits, um, then we can, uh, and typically a complex such as that would be very difficult to, um, to get um, high quality crystals, which you could solve the structure by X-ray diffraction. And then electron microscopy is a really fantastic um, approach for you to be able to tackle those large macromolecular complexes. So the next thing to consider is the homogeneity or heterogeneity of your system. So Derek, um, in, his, in his talk previously, mentioned that um, uh, if you're looking to solve an X-ray structure, a um, crystal structure, then you may um, chop off um, structurally disordered regions, um, flexible loops, um, and other regions which might prevent that protein or macromolecular complex from forming um, a high quality crystal. However, in electron microscopy, we can deal with, um, with systems which have um, structurally disordered regions because simply they just get averaged out in our, um, uh, in our analysis. So we don't see them, but you know that they're there. So if it turns out that for biological function um, those areas are important, then you know that they're being, uh, yeah, then, then you may be able to get some information about those, um, about what those uh, regions are doing. Um, and finally, um, practical considerations. Um, so if somebody comes to us to talk to a project, if you think that CryoEM might be interesting for you in terms of a downstream application, we always say come and talk to us earlier rather than later because we can make recommendations in terms of buffer composition um, and um, advise how much um, volume or concentration of your protein um, you might need. So uh, in terms of volume and concentration, the requirements for material for cryo-electron microscopy typically tend to be um, significantly lower than you would require for um, an X-ray crystallography or an NMR um, experiment. So uh, again, that can be, uh, we, we tend to work with um, researchers who are working with protein complexes which are very difficult to purify and it just may not be practical for them to generate um, sufficient amounts of protein to be able to, to go through X-ray crystal trials, for example. So, 
Um, so moving on, um, when, uh, when you produce your protein and you bring it to leads, the first thing that we typically do is uh, apply negative stain electron microscopy. You can just think of this as initial, an initial quality control step. Um, it's very quick, it's very easy. It would take one of us a couple of hours um, to run your, your preparations through this, um, including all the sample preparation and analysis. Um, and it can give you a very good, quick idea about what your prep looks like and about um, how that preparation is then going to um, behave when you take it through to cryo-electron microscopy. So say it passes this first step and you decide that you want to then proceed to cryo-electron microscopy. The next step is, um, is vitrification. So in this process, uh, we take our, uh, our macromolecular complex and we uh, take about three microliters volume of that specimen and we apply it to one of these cryo-electron microscopy grids shown at the top here. Um, we then um, put that grid into one of these, um, what we call plunge freezing machines, and uh, in a very wasteful way, we then use filter paper to blot away 99.9% .9 of the liquid we've just applied. But what that does is leave a very, very thin film of liquid right across our cryo grid. And we can see on this schematic here, zoomed in, you end up with a very thin layer of, um, of liquid which contains your macromolecular complex of interest. And then we then plunge freeze that grid into liquid ethane, which is cooled down by liquid nitrogen. That has the effect of vitrifying the specimen um, down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, and it creates what we call vitreous or glassy ice. So essentially, our macromolecular complex of interest is now suspended um, in, in, in essentially a sheet of glass in, inside the microscope. And then on the image on the right here, we can see what that looks like in real life. So here you have um, a, a series of macromolecular uh, um, uh, icosahedral virus particles. Um, on a cryo grid. So um, this is the process um, which I guess is quite closely aligned to the optimization of, of, um, of crystal generation um, which was described in Derek's talk. So in an ideal situation you end up with this, with this on the top left where um, your protein is well distributed in the ice and it has a range of angles and if your sample behaves like this then you can take it straight through to data collection. Uh, of course, macromolecular com complexes quite regularly don't behave the way that we wish they did, uh, and it can be a process of fairly significant optimization. And as Derek said, a bit of an empirical process to go through and find the optimal conditions. Um, however, uh, you know, certainly at the University of Leeds, we have a huge amount of experience um, in persuading macromolecular complexes um, uh, into a form, which then means we can collect data and data on them. So once you have your optimized grid, you're ready for data collection. So this is when we then take our grid, put it into one of our state-of-the-art uh, Titan Cryos microscopes. And um, data collection typically looks like between one and three days of automated data collection, where it takes about five hours to set up an automated um, data collection run, and then you'd leave it running for between um, 24 and 72 hours. And during that time period, it would collect thousands of images, such as the one on the left, producing um, many terabytes of raw data, um, which you that can then um, process into your images. However, I do want to point out at this stage that you don't necessarily have to collect um, uh, several days worth of data um, to be able to know whether your, um, whether your project is likely to be successful. So one of the things that's been developed very recently um, or is, is a recent development in the field of cryo electron microscopy are these uh, new image processing pipelines where essentially um, uh, we can these pipelines have been developed where you can take a very small amount of data. So in this example, this is just 30 minutes of data collection for each sample, uh, and then run it through these completely automated um, uh, data processing pipelines, which have no human intervention whatsoever. And out of these, you get an initial result from your processing. So what this would do is give you a very high level of confidence that your, um, that your uh, data collection is going to result um, in, in a successful structure determination before you've then gone and spent um, uh, all your budget in collecting a large data set before realizing there's a problem with the prep or something like that. So this is a really nice um, way for groups that we work with um, to essentially test the water a little bit and before they then commit to longer data collections. But, um, so you've got your data set consisting of many um, terabytes um, and um, you've got uh, the image processing pipeline and it's got many steps which I'm, I'm, which I'm not going to go into today. But essentially what we do um, is calculate the angular um, relationship between the different views of the protein that we see because um, the protein is randomly distributed in the ice layer 
Uh, and then if we can calculate those ang the angular relationship between those different views, and um, we can then back project and, uh, and solve our three-dimensional structure. Um, and just like X-ray crystallography, there are uh, mechanisms by which we can assess uh, uh, the quality of, of that map uh, and, also, and also the resolution. So in terms of the pipeline that I've just described, um, everybody always says, how long is this going to take me? Um, it's enormously variable um, preparation to preparation and project to projects. Uh, and often, um, you know, it, the protein purification, uh, getting a high quality prep in the first place is the most difficult step. Um, but, um, and we sometimes need to, uh, need to iterate between, between these different steps. But this approach is, it, you know, cryo-electron microscopy has really um, uh, come into its own in the last few years. And we've seen some incredibly exciting structures come out of our microscopes at the University of Leeds on a whole range of different macromolecular complexes from amyloid fibrils, viruses, um, soluble complexes. This is quite a labile complex. Um, and of course, crucially, membrane proteins, which are, are notoriously difficult to crystallize. So hopefully I've convinced you cryo-M is the way forward. Um, well, we have a fantastic team at the University of Leeds um, who are able to offer um, expert um, help and support uh, in terms of power electron microscopy. Um, and we, uh, re it's recently been announced, we're now the University of Leeds is going to be leading a national training programme in power electron microscopy. And these um, opportunities will be open um, to both participants from academia and industry. So hopefully I've convinced you today that cryo-EM is a highly flexible technique that can be used to study a whole range of different macromolecular complexes. Um, but what I've hopefully also um, uh, convinced you is that uh, the barrier to entry isn't necessarily as high as you might think. So there are opportunities where you can come and do some um, uh, quick and easy negative stain analysis um, that will then give you confidence about whether your project is going to be tractable um, going forward to high resolution structure determination. Um, and we're highly experienced working with, um, with uh, partners from both academia and industry. So please do get in touch to, um, to talk about your projects. So I just wanted to finish off and say that the um, electron microscopy facility sits within a wider network of world-class research facilities within the University of Leeds. Um, so if um, there is a different technique uh, which we offer that you think you might be interested in, please get in touch. And we, I'd love to put you in touch with the relevant people. So that's all I've got to say. Um, so my email and also our CrowEM email um, uh, are up on display here. And of course, the slides will be shared afterwards. Um, so please, uh, yeah, so please get in touch. Righty-ho. So um, we've got some questions. Yeah, so I should say there's quite a lot of questions and obviously not a lot of time to answer them. So the ones that I don't answer, I will try and reply to in, in text um, later. Um, what, will the prob what problems will be faced if the size of the target is less than 100 kilodaltons? Essentially, the signal associated with each individual um, protein molecule is so weak that we can't accurately determine its, its, um, uh, what angular orientation it's in, and that then prevents us uh, from applying our averaging technique and solving the structure. What's considered to be a good resolution for CRO-REM? Uh, great question. Um, Typically, most of our projects, especially for industry, are looking for a resolu resolution beyond three angstroms. Um, at that resolution, we can build the structure de novo, so we can build in the polypeptide chain without any prior information. Um, and it's also um, typically, um, you're, you're able to identify with high confidence um, a small molecule binding at that sort of resolution. But it may be, depending on your question, that actually you can, uh, you can understand what you, you can get very useful uh, information at a resolution which might be poor you know there might be six or eight angstroms it all depends on on the question that you want to answer really um, and um, the final one um, are we currently using cryo-m to solve the structure of SARS and COVID-2 uh, great question so the facility we do have some coronavirus um, uh, projects coming through at the moment and um, they're still in their very early stages, but hopefully we're going to be able to contribute some structures um, to the community um, in, the, in the near future. Okay, and I think with that, I'm probably out of time. So I shall hand over to the next speaker. Thank you.
see how it slides. Hey, Cam Martin, I don't want a problem on the slideshow. Hold on. Aha, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, thanks, thanks to, for the MDC for inviting us to speak and uh, thanks for uh, Rebecca and Derek for doing an introduction on the sort of structural side. Uh, segues very nicely into what we're going to talk, talk about, um, mainly on what you do <laughs> with structures once, once you've got them and how you, how you use molecules to advance sort of drug discovery. So. Uh, you may not know who Cresset are. Cresset are um, primarily a software company. Um, so we, we deliver software for molecular modeling and discovery, which we sell to, to pharma companies. But you might, might not know that we also do services. So we, we, from 2002, we've delivered about 280 plus projects to customers across, across the world. So we're, we're a growing company, both in software and services. We've got about 35 staff. Um, so why, why do we exist? Um, we, we exist to, to make molecular discovery uh, easier, more efficient. Um, if you think about the, the process of molecular discovery, it involves wet chemistry, um, wet biology, um, might involve structure determination, as you, you've just heard. Uh, these things are really expensive. So people, uh, researchers are very expensive and equipment is very expensive. So. One, one solution to try and make that process a little uh, quicker and more efficient is to, if you can do any of that in silico. So if you can model molecules in silico and get an answer that you know might not mean you have to make that compound and test it, then you can you can you know get there a little quicker and, and cheaply. So you know a lot cheaper to fail uh, in in a computer than it is to fail after you've made compounds and things. So. One of the ways in which we can do this is to describe molecules quite accurately. So, so what we have at Cressa is a method of describing molecules. Uh, it's a molecular mechanics method, but it's an advanced molecular mechanics method. So we have our own uh, force field for describing molecules. And, and you can see at the bottom, there's a whole list of uh, funny names there. Those are the names of our softwares uh, that we use to, to, to model molecules and do these sort of drug discovery workflows. So just a little bit about the science. So what, what we normally are dealing with in, in molecular discovery is we're dealing with molecules. So the thing on the left is a, is a depiction of a molecule. It doesn't tell you much about how that molecule might interact in a protein context. So what you really are interested in is what you get primarily from structure determination, which is what we've just heard about. So what you get then is a bioactive confirmation, and that's the confirmation of the molecule in the context that you're interested in. And so what we do with that information is we can try and describe that much more accurately. So what you're looking at is the electrostatic fields around that molecule that we generate from our force field. Um, and we can use that to develop um, basically a map of the bioactive features of that, of that molecule. So that we call those field points. We can use those like a pharmacophore. It tells us things about that molecule and how we might be able to mimic that molecule with something that is different chemistry, which is primarily what people are looking for. They're looking for a new intellectual property. That means new chemistry, new bonds, different atoms. So this is a really nice way of getting there. So the other thing that we've got is expertise. So we have uh, a number of staff I just described, but they're, they're spread across uh, multiple disciplines. So we've got uh, computational chemists, medicinal chemists, um, we've got people who have done stru structural biology, and you know they're from pharmaceutical industries, biotechnology, agrochem, flavor, and, and these are the areas we also uh, deliver uh, services to. Uh, what do we do? Um, so. We do virtual screening, a lot of virtual screening for our clients to find IP from things you can just buy. Uh, we also um, do protein modeling, homology modeling, uh, various things, compound procurement, lots of stuff, but it's all in, in silico. I think someone, someone asked a, a question about QSAR. So yes, we do QSAR 
once you've got a bioactive confirmation for a molecule, you can do alignments and then look at SAR relationships uh, either qualitatively or quantitatively. So we, we do lots of these sort of in silico uh, tasks. So one of the things that the MDC or clients of the MDC ask us when we have these meetings, very much along the lines of the, the next couple of slides. Uh, so I've, I've built these slides to try and ask, answer these questions. So one of the, the, the initial questions we, we get is, right, we've got a scenario where you need IP for a new protein target. There might not be any ligands. What, you know, what can you do? So the first thing we do is ask a question, you know, what information do we have? Uh, so you might have literature on the, on the system, you might have x-rays, you might know how the thing functions, you might not have this SAR, you may not have proteins or relationships. So, you know, what, what can you do? Uh, the first thing you generally do is look at the sequence of the protein and see if there's anything uh, Related to this protein, that you can then that you know might have X-ray, might have literature data, might have SAR and ligands, and you can then use by inference that information to help you on your protein target. Uh, that might uh, translate into building a homology modeling on that system, and that might lead you to be able to identify a binding pocket. Um, and so we've we've got softwares. So one of these softwares for doing protein modeling we call Flare. We can do dynamics, pocket detection, water modeling, loop modeling. Uh, and you, know, you can start that process once you've got some of these bits of information together. The other thing you can do, obviously, once you've defined uh, a target pocket in a protein, you can do structure-based virtual screening. So you, know, you, you can basically take the dimensions of that pocket and the residues that uh, line that pocket and find molecules that you can just buy uh, so this is, you know, you can buy about 18 million commercial compounds just off the shelf uh, and, and use those to, to increase the efficiency of this process of finding new hit material. So that's one system. Um, uh, we, we can also apply some fairly unique techniques that we've developed at Cresset for describing uh, these molecules once you've got them in the binding site. So this is something called electrostatic complementarity. It tells you the relationship between the electrostatics of the molecule and the electrostatics of the, the pocket. So green is good, red is not so good. Uh, so we can use this as a, as, a, as a metric for saying whether the, the ligand is, is fitting well or not. So it's really quite nice. So sometimes uh, you've got the protein and uh, you can find a related protein by looking at sequences, but you, know, you might also have some ligand data. Once you have some ligand data, then you can start to do other things. So you can look at uh, how that ligand might relate to your protein, either to the, the related protein that you have x-rays to, or you might have built a model from your, your sequence. Uh, but again, once you've defined this ligand binding hypothesis for the molecule, you can start to do very interesting things. So you can do ligand superimposition from the SAR, uh, once you've worked out the bioactive confirmation. <clears throat> you can do SAR analysis, so do QSAR qualitatively or quantitatively using uh, another one of our tools called Forge. Um, you can also do fragment replacement so uh, i think derek mentioned sort of fragment discovery again once you've got a bioactive confirmation of something of even a fragment of an active molecule you can then look at um, scaffold hopping fragment replacements uh, so we've got some really nice tools for that you can also do uh, iterative de novo design uh, the other thing you can do is do a ligand uh, centric virtual screen so you take the bioactive confirmation of the molecule and then look for things that look like that from an electrostatic point of view into your database of, of purchasable compounds. Uh, and, and also, obviously, once you've done that and found things and you found hits, you can repeat this process, take that back into the SAR analysis uh, uh, scenario and, and, uh, and analyze what's active, what's, what's good, what's bad about those molecules. Um, there are other scenarios. So, what if you don't have a protein? Maybe you've just got a, a phenotypic screen. And, and again, um, once you've got any sort of ligand information on you know, things that are active, you can build up uh, bioactive pharmacophores. Uh, we call this process templating. So if you've got multiple chemotypes, 
we've got an automated method for, for aligning those and then extracting what might be a bioactive confirmation for that. And then, again, you can do all these uh, pretty uh, useful things, uh, either virtual screening or design types of thing. So, you know, you, you're either going to result with uh, molecules to synthesize and test or things that you can just buy. Uh, and all of these things can help you find an IP position. So, so one of the things we're actually doing here with our tools is, is doing this sort of quite clever link between uh, the, the chemistry of the molecules and what's important about that, which is actually the 3D nature of the molecule. So we can do these sort of scaffold jumps where you know, that top line is very, very difficult to do in two dimensions. But if you look at the bottom row in three dimensions, because this is the bioactive confirmations we're talking about, it becomes really obvious then how these molecules relate to each other. And you can use that to do either you know, parts of molecule replacement or full molecule replacements. So that's what we're actually doing with the technology. Okay, and typically, you know, the scenarios aren't, you know, either or. Quite often, it's a, it's a bit of a mess if you looked at this slide without seeing the previous ones. Uh, but actually, again, this is where our tools can sort of help this process of, you know, using whatever information there might be on the, the target you're interested in and then bringing that down to something that's solvable in terms of having molecules that you can start to think about. Okay? So, you know, that's, that's sort of the science and the background and the, the workflow. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some examples where we've actually done that. Um, this is an example where we worked with the clients. They had um, a steroid starting point. Um, they were interested in getting new IP. They really didn't want a steroid. So we took that uh, bioactive confirmation of this compound which is the thing that looks uh, like a, a, a set of marbles on the top left. That's the, uh, the, the map uh, with the field points. We searched a database of commercially available compounds. It was only 3 million at that point. And the virtual screening process yielded a whole raft of molecules that have a certain similarity uh, in this sort of field and shape sense to the original input steroid but are very, very different chemistries. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that you get back from this process. You get nice uh, new IP, uh, hopefully, that you can then go and, go and patent. Um, this is another example. So this is um, for, for an agrochem company. It was originally a company called, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name. Um, but they, they, they were essentially uh, divergence, that's what they were called. Um, they were bought by Monsanto, um, so they, they had a, a product that um, killed nematodes, so it was a, a nematocide. Uh, and we, we did this uh, chemistry, we did a, a virtual screen, uh, and it produced uh, a, a basically a product for them. So it's the equivalent of finding a drug from the virtual screening process, and this is the patent. And Tim Cheesewright, who's our director of products, was, was intimately involved with this project. Um, this one's another one. Uh, this is a, a PNAS paper uh, where we worked with an antifungal company. Obviously, this isn't virtual screening. This is um, uh, trying to work out a binding hypothesis for the molecule. Uh, but this, this was in a, a, pro, a homology model. There's no crystallography available for this target yes, yet. It's um, a, a di dihydroorate dehydrogenase enzyme. Uh, very, very difficult to, to crystallize in the, in the yeast. Uh, form of it. Um, so that's uh, most of what I wanted to talk about. Um, and, you know, I'm open to questions. Thanks, Martin. Do you want to put your questions in the Q&A box? Great. Okay. Uh, right. Let's have some questions. Uh, great question. So, so there's, a, there's a question about um, uh, how useful are crystal structures if they, they're not necessarily relevant to the, the pharmacologically uh, relevant system? Uh, great, great question. So it, it's always useful to get crystal structure. It's always better to have one than to not have one. Uh, but then how you use those uh, is interesting. So if you think about um, an x-ray structure as a snapshot in time, 
then you know you need to think about what the protein flexibility is, what the movement might be, uh, and whether that that ligand. Uh, is going to move or whether they're flexible residues or not. And, and sometimes you can get that from looking at multiple x-rays um, or you can take that system and maybe run a, a, a dynamics run on it. So you take the structure as a starting point and then do dynamics to see where the thing is moving around. So there, you know, there are lots of things you can do. Uh, you can think about um, the SAR, uh, whether the SAR makes sense relative to the, the, the bioactive confirmation pose. So, you know, molecules move around and adapt and proteins adapt as well. So, you know, you need to look at this thing holistically to try and solve that as a problem. Um, for the, uh, the Tanimoto score for uh, s uh, screening, uh, the, the similarity that we use is, is our own. So it's similar to a, a Tanimoto score. So it's a number between one uh, one and zero. So anything above sort of 0.7 is great. But the difference between Tanamoto and, and our score is this is a it's a 3D uh, similarity, so a field and shape similarity score. So anything above 0.7 is is interesting. Um, you can you can identify allosteric pockets by by looking at the, the data. So if you look, if you get a crystal structure, you can have a look at the surfaces of that, looks at the, look at the nooks and crannies. You can also look at the interactions between proteins uh, and their partners. So quite often you, you get sort of uh, sticky spots on the surface of proteins and they, they can usually represent allosteric pockets. You can mimic protein-protein um, uh, interactions with our software uh, and use those as a starting uh, point for finding an allosteric inhibitor for a system. Um, how much do I trust homology models? Uh, it, that's a great question. Um, homology models, um, you need to be very, very careful building a homology model. And, and really, it, it's dependent on how much information you start with to how much confidence you can have uh, you know how well that, that model reflects reality. So you know there are lots of things that you can do. Uh, Derek talked about Ramachandran plots. Um, again, it, it's better to look at multiple X-ray evidence if you can as starting points for homology models. Um, and, it, and it's you know you, you can look at specific residues, but I, I like to tie up uh, crystallography and SAR together to try and interpret what that, that means. So, you know, I, I would certainly spend a lot of time uh, building a good homology model. It's very, very easy to build rubbish homology models. I'll say that. Okay, thanks, Martin. Brilliant. Thank you. There, thank you for those questions. So thanks, thanks everybody. Um, thank you for the speakers, um, Derek, Rebecca, and Martin for steering us through the third of our NDC Connects webinar series. Um, next time we're going to be focusing on optimizing the compound. And we've got three talks. Um, we've got in silico drug design, what to do and what not to do, and that's by Al Dossiter of Medchemica, and then Richard Weaver. Um, CEO at Xenogesis is going to talk about optimizing ADME and PK properties of the molecule. So common mistakes made and how to identify and resolve the key issues. And then Juliana Maynard at the Medicines Discovery Catapult will take us through imaging technologies to understand the PK and biodistribution of the candidate compound. So thanks again to all the speakers for today and thanks everyone for attending. See you next week. Thank you.